もしやコスモではコスモ AP ラミュアリースポーツ This is part 46 of body 76 match of the Cosmo restoration Last time we did a whole bunch of metal fab to mount 2007 BMW 328i seats into the Cosmo. I think this time we're going to do something that has a bit of a mix of some sheet metal work and some electronics. So hearken your brain all the way back to episode 9. What happened in episode 9? Well, I shaved the door handles. And now that both doors open with the push of a button, I just need to do the exterior sheet metal work. Cool. Now, normally, these types of systems are actuated by a remote,、ah. which I have and I will use. But, I mean, having another one of these things hanging off my keychain all the time is kind of annoying, and it's,、uh, how shall we say this, pretty pedestrian. So these are RFID tags, and these are RFID readers. You're going to ask me, what the hell's an RFID? Well, RFIDs are secret. Little chips that the beast uses to identify you that was implanted in the back of your neck by Obamacare. No, actually, only half of that is true. RFIDs are little chips that, when stimulated by a RFID reader, spit back some information. Depending on the chip, that information could just be an ID number or it could be up to, I think, about four or eight kilobytes of data that you can. Program into said chip. They have a very short range, only a few centimeters, and as far as I know, they're not being injected into any human by any World Health Care organization. There are two common types of RFID in use today 13.56 megahertz and 125 kilohertz. Both types Are made by the billions in China and can be picked up for very little money on the eBay. The main difference between the two types is that the 13.5 megahertz tags hold a lot more information and can be easily programmed, where most, if not all, 125 kilohertz tags just kind of spit back an ID and you really can't program them. I've created a very simple test rig for both readers. It's just an Arduino Uno connected via software serial to the 125 kilohertz reader, the 13.5 megahertz reader connecting through the SPI bus. There's really not much to the software that runs it. Honestly, it took about seven minutes of copying and pasting because. The 13.5 megahertz、um, uh, reader has a nice software library, and the 125 kilohertz reader just spits out the data via the serial port. So, really, it's just a software serial port for the、uh, 125 kilohertz, the、um, library for the uh, um, 135 megahertz. Some setup stuff initializing both readers, and then a loop that just checks if the software serial has data and spits it back to the serial port if there is. And same difference for the 13.5 megahertz reader. It's just done through the library with a few different calls, checking if there's a card present, read the data, dump it out via the serial port. So let's fire that into the Arduino. Got power lights on both readers, and the Arduino is communicating via the serial console. So let's try the 13 megahertz tag. You can see that there's a lot of information in this tag coming back on the serial console. 
Looks like the range is about one centimeter. And if I move it away, I lose communication. But the important part is that I've got the card ID. All the rest of this stuff, which I can program, is just a bonus. So let's call that about one centimeter to get a reliable read. Well, right away, I can tell that the range of the 125 kilohertz tag is about twice as much as the 13 megahertz tag. Of course, the only thing that this tag provides is the ID and a checksum digit, which is just blasted out to the serial console. It's important to note that neither tag scans when separated from the reader by metal, and the coil definitely doesn't like being on top of a piece of metal because it reduces the range to about a few millimeters. However, space it away from the metal just a bit, and the long range comes back. Honestly, I was kind of hoping to use the 13 megahertz tags because they hold a lot more information. But if the 125 kilohertz can give me more performance, then that's what I'll use. I think the logical place to put this is naturally right here. You know what that means. Kinda sucks I spent all that effort in episode 10 doing this sheet metal work just to cut it out and stick an RFID reader in there. Okay, let's call that about one and three eighths wide. One and three eighths. So this will be roughly where the coil is going to sit in the pocket I'm creating for it. And I want there to be about one inch on all sides between it and metal because I think that's going to keep the metal from interfering with the RF. Okay, to the bandsaw. Of course, the car has two doors, so I need two of these things.
two boxes done, one for each door, and in each box the uh, antenna coil of the RFID reader will sit just below flush, about here. Of course, it needs to be supported around all of this, and there's this big empty space. Can't make a uh, metal support bracket, neither steel nor aluminum, because that interferes with the antenna. Of course, there's always the option of just packing this full of body filler, but that violates two of the major rules of body filler. Don't use it to fill enormous holes, and really never more than a quarter inch. So I uh, researched um, some of the common plastics that could be 3D printed. Uh, ABS, PET, PLA, etc., etc., but all of them had a wildly different thermal expansion and contraction coefficient than steel, uh, meaning that if I was to print a bracket and then bury this in a skim coat of body filler on the door, it would crack because the expansion between the surrounding door and the bracket would be different. That leaves but one option. Fiberglass. Fiberglass has almost the exact same coefficient of thermal expansion and contraction as compared to steel. So it will be the ideal uh, material to make a bracket out of. That being said, I have never used fiberglass before. I, I am a complete cloth and resin virgin. So. I guess you'll be with me on my quest of self-discovery. What I can do though is uh, print the molds that I will use to make the fiberglass brackets. Uh, I could make them out of wood or something, but it seems like it would just take a lot more time than simply drawing up in CAD and printing it out. So, start with an outer ring. I've already measured the metal boxes and written those measurements down, so I know uh, what my measurements are for the molds. All I have to do then is draw the uh, components out and punch in the measurements. Eight millimeters by three millimeters. Center that. Oops. Center that. And draw inner wall at thirty millimeters by forty-two millimeters by negative three millimeters. Center that. And we need a hole for the bolt. Seven millimeters, and then one on the front at seven millimeters. And if we render that out, bingo, here is one fiberglass mold box with the four bolt holes, which will secure the fiberglass mold, and the um, bump to make the indentation for the coil. My uh, rapid prototyper currently lives in the basement of my parents' house because my basement has out of control humidity and my shop's kind of dirty. So I've loaded it with some white PLA filament and we'll get started um, printing the fiberglass molds. Well, when I started 
printing these things, I set the camera to what I thought was time-lapse mode, thinking that I would get some amazing time-lapse footage of these things printing. What I ended up with was seven pictures. Seven pictures. So, here's that footage now. Wow, wasn't that amazing? In fact, it's so spectacular. Here it is again. There we go. There are tens of thousands of YouTube videos of time-lapse 3D printing, so I guess if you want to see these things printed, you can uh, look up some of them and imagine what it's like. So right now I am just waxing the mold um, to prevent fiberglass from sticking. Keeping in mind I have never done this before, so I am only going off the knowledge that I have absorbed over the years, and that knowledge says wax the mold. I honestly do not care if I destroy these molds, removing the fiberglass part, because these are one-off. And I can always print more if I need to. Am I going to say, wax on, wax off? No. I'm going to need some way to secure the fiberglass bracket to the car itself. So I am going to do my best to embed four nut certs into each bracket. Whether I will end up using all four, I don't know. But now is the time to um, add them as opposed to drilling them and uh, putting in the nut certs later. Well, I can already tell this is going to be messy because I handled this fiberglass nut for about three seconds and it shed hundreds of tiny fiberglass strands. Yay! This might be why I have never worked with fiberglass before. Okay, so the first step is to cut a few pieces to roughly the size of the area I need to fill. Well, okay. Now, once I start mixing things, the instructions say I have about 12 minutes to work with the resin. So, I won't have a lot of time to be messing with the camera. This might all be in one take. Each one of these cups is three fluid ounces. Okay, close enough. According to the instructions, it is 10 drops of hardener. That's 30 drops. One. Two, three, four, eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Oh, thirty-two. Okay. The clock starts now. Oh, it's changing colors. I guess that means it's mixed. It also has become a lot more smellier. Really wish I had that shop vent fan. And away we go. Okay. So. Resin first. I may have mixed up a lot more resin than was necessary. Live and learn. Find a glass of cloth. Gather it needs more resin. Wow, this does smell truly awful. I don't want to be flattening down. Oh, there it goes. Oh, yeah. Just 
Every boat builder on YouTube is probably laughing at me right now. It wants to have problems adhering to the side. So maybe what I'll do is add another piece right here. I'm just going to keep packing her in there. I'm almost actually out of resin in that cup, so I mean, I'll just mix more and uh, keep going. I don't quite know when to stop on this. Um, I guess when it's thick. getting pretty thick. I think it's over. Just enough to wet this down. Well, I'm out of resin in this cup anyway. Okay, I mixed up another cup of resin and hardener and off camera just kept layering it on with specific attentions to building up the corners. So I'm almost done. The idea here isn't to make this one solid piece, but to maybe make it about a quarter inch thick, give or take. And I found that by building up the corners, it wraps around the nut certs pretty well. And I think we're, we're probably on one of the last layers. Uh, what I'll likely do is just resin this in place and then do maybe one big layer above everything just to smooth it out. I don't know how this works. Now one of the tricks I gather is you can tell that you've completely saturated the mat when the white goes away. The white indicating like air pockets and um, uncoated fibers. This is also warming up pretty well. Hopefully it doesn't distort my mold too much. I printed it using PLA plastic which has a melting temperature of about 150 Fahrenheit. Needless to say, brushes used for this are single use only. I think these brushes were 29 cents each, made in China, out of, I don't know, dissident hair? that one a little bit with cloth. So it's going to take a little bit to beat out the uh, air bubbles. Now I'm just putting a little bit of resin on these edges so that it kind of solidifies because I'm going to have to run this thing through the band saw to saw off these edges and it'll maybe keep all the fiberglass strands from flying around the show. Yes. Okay, well, it's <laughs> stuck. I have created something that is hopefully something a bit more than a mess. It is quite warm from the resin curing. The mold seems to be reasonably intact. So we're going to have to let this sit a few days and see what I ended up with. Now, of course, there's the uh, second one to do. However, the second one is exactly the same as the first, just more resining and packing and smoothing. So, I don't think we need to cover the whole thing on camera. 
However, there is one thing that I've learned, so when I do that, I'll let you know. The thing that I learned after the first go around was I had a bunch of trouble getting the first big piece of mat to seat evenly on uh, the mold impression for the antenna coil. So, what I'm going to do this time, instead of using one big mat, some more resin in there, make it really moist. Instead of uh, doing one big mat, I am going to first outline it in a bunch of small mats. And then I'll build up the inside once the uh, small mats are um, adhered. There. Just do that a few more times and I should get a much better uh, mold impression. Now these have had plenty of time to cure fully, so it's time to demold de them. Oh, bolts come out, so that's promising. Now what I'm doing is just cutting all of this flash off from the top, which should allow me to pry this out of the mold. Well, I only printed this mold with about 10% infill because I figured I would just have to break it apart to get the uh, piece out. That's actually separating pretty easily. Cool! These ended up just a little bit heavier than I'd like them, so what I think I will do is mill some of the excess material out. Something tells me I should not be breathing that dust. That's a little lighter. I just printed out the sides of the CAD drawing to use as a template so that I can drill the required mounting holes and they will match up. the fiberglass piece. Yay! Everything still fits. Now the coils sit right in these little indentations. What we'll have to do is drill a hole the wire to pass through. Okay, let's try that again.
that's the idea. I'm going to fiberglass these coils in to uh, completely seal everything and make sure no moisture can uh, get behind the uh, eventual bodywork that will cover this. So first, just a little bit of wax and grease remover to remove the wax that I used when I molded these things. Okay, and here we go again. Now this stuff is time sensitive. I have only a few minutes once it's mixed, so we'll probably be doing this in one take. Three ounces of goo, which is actually a lot more than I need. Seven, eight, nine, thirty. Close enough. So what we'll do is put a good coat of resin underneath this thing. Kind of embed it in there. There we go. Put some more in there. There we are. Piece of fiberglass cloth. To cover it and add the resin. Figure another layer can't hurt. Just to lock everything down. Now, we let that cure. Now, I tested these readers um, after I encased them in fiberglass to make sure they still work, and they do. Uh, the range does not seem to be affected. Oh, that's kind of heavy. I took the door off the car because it's going to be a lot easier to work with. Now, the idea is that these metal pockets will be welded into each door about here-ish. I think a good placement is about two and a half inches from this body line here, an inch and a half from the weld line left over from when I shaved the door handles. Remember all the work I put into straightening the door? after I welded in these panels. Before I weld this thing into the door, I'm going to add some studs to the bottom of it three inches apart. So that there will be some way to mount the RFID reader electronics. Sweet. Well, now I just have to weld it in. Well, well, 
poking this pocket into the door. I have the welder turned down pretty far, but honestly, I'm really not that worried about warpage because, of course, in order for this thing to work, it has to be covered by something non-metallic, so we're talking filler or fiberglass. So what I'm going to have to do is dent around this to sink this just a little bit below the surface level so I can build that filler up. Of course, thus, it hides any warpage. bottom. Sanity check. Yep, still fits. Of course, last time I counted, the Cosmo has two doors. So of course, I have to do this twice. Well, just like the other door, I'm removing the irreplaceable window glass. Glass. And door. Now as standalone modules in a controlled environment, these things are great, however, the car is not exactly a controlled environment. So I need to make a little board on which to mount this that drops the car's 12 volts down to 5 volts and provides a little bit of power protection. To design the board, I'm using my favorite uh, PCB design program, Copper Connection. Unfortunately, a little while ago, Copper Connection was purchased by Express PCB and renamed to Express PCB Plus. They then removed a whole bunch of features. Thankfully, I archived the installer for the old version, so I can still use the good version. So, I just made a pattern of the RFID reader. I've added the two protection diodes, reverse polarity and... Um, reverse voltage spike, connected it all with traces. Really the circuit just consists of a filter capacitor, a 78L05 voltage regulator, uh, another filter capacitor, and the aforementioned diodes. So I'll straighten those traces all up because one of the things that really bothers me when designing a board is traces that do not run at right angles. And then highlight them all and thicken them up to make them a little bit easier to work with by hand and to print out a little bit better and finally also increase the size of all the pads which makes it a hell of a lot easier to drill manually and there's the board ready to be printed as I did with the tail lights I'm going to use the toner transfer method of printing these boards one of the important steps here is to crank the toner darkness as far as it will go and make sure to tell the printer that you are printing on heavy paper. Not bad at all. You'll notice that whenever I do this, I usually print multiple copies of the same board 
primarily because these papers are single use only. They can only go through the printer once. And also, I always like to have a few extra around just in case I want to make more boards. Very important to remove all the oxidation and fingerprints and junk from the board. So, first gets a wipe down with some acetone, then a scuff with the old green scotch brite, then to transfer the board pattern from the paper to the board, it just gets put through a laminator and the paper is designed to release the toner under the heat. That direction. Then reverse directions and go again. You really have to wonder how many idiots got their ties caught in a laminator for them to specifically mention not to wear ties. Then it goes into a water bath to release the paper. You have to be gentle with the air, otherwise you can blow the toner right off the board. Barrett chloride actually isn't too bad on the skin from a corrosive perspective. Really the main reason I wear the gloves is because this stuff stains like you wouldn't believe. I don't know if this stains worse than POR 15, but it's damn close. Warmed up the ferric chloride in the microwave. So now I sit here and do this for about 15 minutes. Ooh. In fact, probably got it too hot because my eyes are watering a bit, which means it is releasing gaseous chlorine. God, I gotta get that vent fan in here. Almost. It's just a little bit in the center that still needs to be etched. Sometimes just rubbing it a bit helps. Of course that's true for a lot of things. <clears throat> I think that is etched. So into the water. Those turned out pretty well. make a joke about drilling a bunch of tiny holes, but that would be in bad taste. A little acetone to remove the uh, toner, and then a quick polishing with a scotch Brite pad before soldering. Now these are pretty simple circuits, basically just um, power protection and some headers for the uh, serial and RF connectors. So I did not bother to even um, drop a schematic, I just kind of did these 
off the top of my head. But what I can do is put a schematic on my website. The circuit is basically just a 78L05 um, voltage regulator with the necessary input and output filter capacitors. A reverse biased diode to um, absorb any voltage spikes. And then a forward bias diode that the power supply must conduct through to prevent reverse polarity hookup from damaging the circuit. And that's basically all there is. I switched to a different brand of printed circuit board blanks after I did the tail lights. And I gotta say, this brand solders much nicer than the other ones, even though I have to use crappy lead-free solder, because it's impossible to find leaded solder these days. That only took a few minutes. Wires for uh, power ground and serial out. Now before I uh, solder the module on, I guess I should give this a test. So I'll hook it up to my power supply, which is set to about 14 volts. No smoke yet. Okay, we should have 14 volts coming in. Yep. And about 13 volts after this diode. Yep. And then finally, 5 volts, which is the whole point of this arrangement power the module. Yes we do. Perfect. Now as you may have been able to guess, I designed these boards so that the RDM 6300 okay. would fit right on top. Yes, I could have used surface mount components for an even more compact installation, but honestly, the module. I think fits perfectly with the regular old easy to use and easy to solder through hole components. Rigged it up with the Arduino again for testing and yep still works. Seems like the range has increased too. Cool. A little bit of flux remover to clean off the soldering flux. Now you'll notice that there are no mounting holes on these boards. And that is because I intend to encapsulate them completely in epoxy within the case. Because these things are, of course, living inside the door where they're going to get wet and, well, not snowy because I'll be driving the car in the snow, but wet, dirty. I just had to de-thicken the walls a little bit so the uh, modules would fit in place. Now these pieces will form the cases something like this.
All right. Two tiny cases achieved. And I just need to drill some mounting holes. If you'll recall, the mounting studs are three inches apart, and this thing is four inches long, which means a hole half an inch from each side. Drilling them just a little bit large so there's a little wiggle room. Sometimes you need a little wiggle room in a hole. Quick wrapping of a few layers of electrical tape to prevent the uh, solder joints from rubbing up against the uh, case. So they just slip into the case and of course they need to be secured into the case as well and the lid on this side needs to be attached. Now I can't TIG weld it on. I mean I probably could with a few little tacks. However, I'm not going to do that because this has to be completely hermetically sealed. Um, it's going to be in a door, it's going to get wet, electronics, water doesn't uh, mix. So I'm going to accomplish attaching the end and the ceiling with some potting epoxy. This stuff is made by MG Chemicals and is electrically insulating, uh, waterproof, and quite expensive. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Now, there's about a 45 minute working time on this stuff, so I, I don't have to um, hurry. Just gotta make sure it's all thoroughly mixed. Okay, just a little bit of hot glue to make sure the epoxy doesn't ooze out of the uh, hole here. Okie dokie, let's make a mess. Stuff flows a lot more than I thought it would. Well, after waiting about 10 minutes, it looks like all the bubbles have come to the surface. So it's time to close these up. Or a lot. And then, I'll just slip the aluminum cap over. Hopefully, it will stay reasonably in place. A little bit of tape to hold this while it cures for 24 hours. After a few days of curing, it appears to be solid. <clears throat> I added a little bit of tape because while it was being poured, it was kind of oozing out of some of the cracks. Really, the last step before these can go in the car is to install the connectors for the wiring harness. Now, somewhere around here, my good crimpers that have weather pack crimping dies are missing. So until then, it's back to the freaking needle nose pliers and a little bit of solder. A little bit of flux remover. And the seal. And okay. Just nine more of those to do. Done. So now all I have to do is put a matching connector on the reader coil and it can go back in the car.
I left the connector body off of the reader coils so that they can be slipped into the doors. Finally, the pain in the ass of bolting these things into the door. I can't even get a camera angle in there, but I have to say, because of the limited access, the swivel socket is a requirement, and even then, it's still about as much fun as sniff testing random underwear found at the side of the road. module just slides onto these two studs and then there's the fun of getting this hardware on. Okay, toss that back on the car. With the door back on the car, it is time for the moment of truth, for which I've created this terrifying test rig. The rig consists of an Arduino Uno with digital pin 11 connected to a relay board, the relay on the relay board set up to switch the um, door solenoid, the RFID reader connected through this yellow wire to the serial input of the Arduino. And what I've done is wrote a really quick program for the UNO that just looks for the uh, ID number of this test tag and then switches the relay for one second when it receives it. Hold on to your butts. Here we go. Of course, all this mess is just temporary, because what's going to happen when this is finalized is the RFID readers are going to feed back through a nice three-conductor shielded cable to the ECU of the car, which will then compare the tags and run the door locks. Yeah, okay, that's pretty awesome. But, you know, I still have to carry around an RFID tag, so this thing will be dangling off my keychain. I guess I could make it into a ring or something, but no, I want something a little bit more convenient, something I'm not going to lose, something a little bit more permanent. That's right, I'm going to put it inside me. That's what she said. I want you to open it, yeah. Well, that's why you're a professional at this. Yes, yes, I am. I'm, I'm a sexy nurse by trade. Can you sterilize my... Sterilize your area? Sterilize my area, please. Yes. You kind of squeeze it, I think. Oh, thought I broke it. Yeah, I think you did. Okay. Oh, it's coming out. Yeah, it's coming I think out. I was supposed to break it. I think so. Side. Yeah. It's like when you break um one of the yeah. lights. Can you do the like the whole freaking area? The whole freaking area. Yeah. Because I mean I don't think you can use too much. No, I don't think so. And sure. did you undo your fingers or are your fingers good? Sure. Sterile fingers. This looks <clears throat> legit. Don't do the same thing. As opposed to the video of the person I saw online doing this whose wife just used like bare, bare hands. hands with no hint of sterilization whatsoever. Oh, humans. Okay. If I know the rest of my arms on this. Yeah, it is not secure. Yeah, that'd be terrible. It's a piece of drywall left over from my bathroom renovation. Ooh, sterile. Well, to be fair, it is mold resistant drywall. Oh, okay, well that's fine. I wouldn't use just the regular drywall. <laughs> no, particle board, yes. That's like 
That's a bit of a bit of a beast. No worse than giving blood. Ow. <laughs> I just poked myself with it. <laughs> no worse than giving blood. Ow. <laughs> I poked myself through the glove with it. <laughs> this is why I'm not a doctor. <laughs> or a body piercer. <laughs> oh. Yep, so we have to go between the joint here, there's a bone, mm -hmm. there's a bone here, Yep. which puts us in the middle here-ish. Okay. Alright. Can you pull that away and kind of wiggle it a little bit? Mm-hmm. And then okay. just take your hand, just let go for a sec, I just want to make sure that's the right spot. I think, we, yeah, I think, I think that's good. Let's get there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay, here we go. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Give it a roll. Uh -huh, whatever. Okay. Just <clears> the tip? A lot more than the tip's going in. Oh, yeah, that is. Does it tickle? Yep. Feel it. Is it going to poke out the skin? No. Okay. No. Oh, hold on. Ooh. Yep. Is it poking out the skin? No, not quite, but I did see the tip of it. Um, okay, wait. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it, how is it now? It's good now. Okay. Okay, can you let go? Let go? Yep. Okay, so it's right about here. Yep. Okay. Okay. You want a band-aid? Well, let's just... And a sucker? Oh, there's some blood coming out there. Okay, Where I'm going to get you a band-aid. Where is it? Oh. oh, I think that's it right there. That's it right there. Okay. Let me get you a band-aid. Mm -hmm. Do you want more uh, sterilizing stuff? Or? Yeah, actually, could you wipe it with the alcohol swab just in case? Yes, I can. Huh. I could do nursing stuff. <laughs> that went really well. Yeah. Still alive! In dish. Okay. Kind of stinging now though. How about this? Does that sting? Actually, I can't feel that. Really? There's some can you mop up the blood. <laughs> oh, bleeding again. Oh no. I think it's gonna bleed for a little while. Yeah, hang yeah. on. Hold that. Yeah. Let me band-aid you. Okay. <laughs> That's the problem with gloves. Nice. I was gonna say you want high five after this, but not on this hand. <laughs> Left hand high that. five. Let's see how it goes. Hey, it's really okay. bad. You've done it. I have been implanted. Yeah, with my seed. <laughs> <laughs> so, patient, how was the procedure? Well, I think it was fine. I really didn't hurt much at all, to be honest. It was a complete success. We were very sanitary on the procedure. I think we did a good job. Yeah, you know, I uh, was putting something into my body, so I'm going to take this pretty seriously. As you should. <laughs> and with that, this episode is done. It's a day after the insertion, and uh, that area of the hand is a little bit sore, a little bit swollen, but otherwise fine. So you're probably asking me, how am I going to top this? I don't know. I really have no idea what I'm doing next, because there are a number of directions I could go. So we're going to do this. What's next? You decide. On my Patreon, there is a poll. Link bottom of the screen somewhere. 
Um, you can vote on what the next Cosmo project will be, and the winner of the poll will get done. Well, I just want to say thank you to my dear friend Lynette for helping me out and uh, nursing me in this video. You're welcome. See what I did there? Nursing? Like, boobs. Hello!